Okay, Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een amma ba'd. This is Abu Ayyub with Muslim Apologetics Podcast, and I'm here today with Abu Zakaria, who has written a number of books, um, most famous of which was with the AIRA organization, which is a book called The Eternal Challenge that has been used in their um, dawah for a, a couple of years now. And he is the owner of ManyProfitsOneMessage.com. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you doing, brother? Alhamdulillah, I'm good. Um, so today we're having a podcast where we're going to be replying to James White and, and actually replying to his reply of your video um, that you just released recently. Um, and basically, he's James White um, went through step by step of what what he believed was the mistakes in your video but from what we've seen from a muslim apologetics point of view uh that these these arguments that he's made against the video itself it, it tends to be um quite he, he's he's constantly making the same mistakes of our interpretation of his interpretation um so what what do you think about that what is uh, your opinion about his uh, take on first and foremost his his belief that we don't really understand what uh, the Trinity is and the difference between the three persons and the one being. Yeah, I mean, I think his response, um, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors involved. Um, you know, the, the reason why we, we take different interpretations is that we, we don't approach the text with a mindset of the Trinity is definitely true and therefore read it into everything, we let the text speak for itself. And, you know, I tend to take the literal apparent meaning, unless it's obviously metaphor, um, unless there's an indication that it's obviously a metaphor. So I think that that's kind of the difference is the, is the approach. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's kind of the problem here because the basis of the, the Christian theology, when you go into, the, when you're stepping or approaching their scripture, they constantly say, well, let the Bible speak for itself. You know, the, the exegesis that you're going to take out of it. And uh, th there's a methodology that you're going to take when you're approaching the Bible. And like it or not, Christians, when they're reading the Bible, they are bringing in a bias. They're bringing in, it's, it's, it's considered to be hermeneutics, where they're coming and they're bringing in their own interpretations and they're reading the text as, as they want. Now, when, when James White was um, trying to reply or maybe refute your video, he was saying that, well, Muslims, they constantly misrepresent Jesus. They don't understand what he's saying, and they only focus on the negative or the humanistic side and not the sides that appear that, that make it appear that Jesus is God. And we, when I heard this, I was, you know, I, I was kind of taken aback because it's almost the opposite effect when it comes to Christians as well. We approach the Bible and we see clear passages that shows the humanity not only from the words of Jesus but from a logical and, and theological standpoint that this person this individual this representation of this person Jesus is a human being and he's not number one all-knowing number two all-powerful and, and 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 clearly it's the it 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 appears to be a first generation Greek ignorant Greek viewpoint of what God is. Um, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the perfect example which is cited in the video is, you know, John 17, where Jesus prays to the Father and he says, Father, the hour has come. And then he says that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So here we've got who is allegedly the second person of the Trinity saying to the first person of the Trinity, you are the only true God. So, you know, how, how you draw from that or how you can conclu conclude from that, that Jesus is God, I have no idea. Um, you know, th th this is one of the most explicit and crystal clear examples where, you know, that Jesus is not God. And he's explicitly saying the Father is the only true God. Um, so that's a perfect example of, um, you know, of, of coming, coming to it with a different mindset um, and reading into what, what he's saying, or in this case, completely ignoring what he's saying. Um, you know, this is a, this is a very uh, problematic verse for Trinitarians because if you look at Church Father Augustine, for example, uh, he wrote a book called The Homilies um, uh, on John, and he actually rearranged this verse 
so that it didn't exclude Jesus from the Godhead. That's how worrying and problematic it is for Trinitarians. I think it's a perfect example of how, you know, the, the, the clear and apparent meaning is that Jesus is not part of a Trinity, yet they still conclude that he is a member of a Trinity, and that just boggles my mind. Yeah. And, 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 and James White, in his so-called refutation, he said, well, we don't understand the hypostatic, un uh, hypostatic union. And um, he said this actually uh, in February when I released my video as well, um, where I made a clear distinction saying, look, there's God, there's the creator, and then there's creation. And these two things have to be distinct from one another. So what he, the Christian doctrine is as well, the, the hypostatic union is as well, God came, the, a part of God, came down and then there was a create there well, was a human a, pers a person of god yeah, yeah of a person of god you know he's gonna pick out that 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 one that, <laughs> that little word there well i mean in, in reality it's it's the 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 spirit of god i mean maybe we can start with that right now let's let's start before creation and everything the tri their viewpoint of what the triune is it's a substance of god a godhead that has three consciousness three conscious uh, uh or natures or personhoods right and it's it's a substance and then from that jesus leaves that group that triune group and comes down and then takes the mantle of a perfect human being and this is this is this is where we have a problem and and james white he 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 says well muslims believe they they put limitations on god because we say god can't do this and he he tried to get uh, philosophical with us and says well Muslims believe God can actually do actions within time. We're getting deep into th theology here, but I think we need to cover this point. Is yep. He was saying, well, in, in our theology, God does actions in time. So for God to come down as a man, he's doing it's the equivalent of him doing an action in time. He's not uh -huh. changing his nature, that spirit, that, that spirit or that essence. that It's not being changed. He actually used the word being, but it should be nature. Uh -huh. um, so... That doesn't change. It doesn't mix with the humanity of the person. So it's not diminishing. And, we, and he says, well, you're putting a limitation on God. And what we're saying is, is it's or you're saying God can't do that. So that's limiting God. We're saying it's not that God. And I said this in my other video. It's not that God couldn't. It's that God wouldn't. And I mm -hmm. made this emphasis and James White knew it. And he stopped there and he saw it. And it, there's a difference between being able to do something and then not doing something because it's beneath you. You are above doing those particular things. And that's the, that's the constant emphasis that we make on this, is that for God to come down as a man, there is nothing, if God is the all-powerful, there is nothing that he needed to do to come down, there's nothing that he needed to accomplish as coming down as a man into the human form. And this is the thing that boggles the mind with Muslims, is that him coming down and humiliating himself, it's... It's the equivalent of you saying that God came down as a monkey or you got God came down as a, you know, a tree that I chopped up into pieces and then lit on fire. I'm not going to say God couldn't do that. It's that God, it's diminishing to his status of being the all powerful. It's all it's from a theological perspective. It's almost the equivalent of when atheists tell you, can God create a rock so big that he can't pick it up? You know, you're not you're not understanding. You're missing the mark here. From a theological perspective, I don't know if you can add on to that, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I personally don't go down the route of um, God um, could do it, but He wouldn't do it because they'll say, yeah, because that's because your, that's your Islamic theology that's talking, and you know, from my Trinitarian theology, yes, He can because He did. So the the way I prefer to tackle it is, look, according to the own standards and principles set out in the Bible, God cannot change. Now, you know, when they say that, oh, but he acted in time and they get philosophical, look, this is the point, right? Even though the incarnation is God acting in time, in zero CE when Jesus was born, the point is that it has permanent implications on the nature of God, which is that God now has a permanent human nature fused onto a, uh, an eternally divine nature that is now eternally joined in the second person of, uh, of the Trinity. Yeah. That's the point. So even though it was an act in time, in the incarnation, it has eternal consequences on the nature of, 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 uh, of, of God. And it, it is really, it is a philosophical argument because, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, was God a man before? No, he was not. 
did he become a man? And is he eternally now uh, have this human nature on the second person of the Trinity? Yes, he does. So of course there was a change. I like to give an analogy of, um, of, of, a, of a human being becoming a God. Um, even though we don't believe this is possible uh, from an Islamic point of view, but for the sake of, a, of argument and to demonstrate the point, let's say we had um, uh, the being called John. And John just has a human nature. He's a human being, right? God then grants him a second nature, a divine nature. So now John has a dual nature, a human nature and a divine nature. Would any rational person say, because John's human nature wasn't changed, and it's merely now being complemented by an additional nature, he therefore hasn't changed overall? So John, from going from a mere mortal to master of the universe now, would you say he hasn't changed because his original human nature hasn't changed? It's a nonsensical argument. So Jesus and John are at the same end point. They're now both God men. Their starting point was different, but their end point is now the same, right? They've got two dual natures and they're now God men. Would you ever say, could you ever say in a rational way that John hasn't changed? It, just, it doesn't make any sense, right? Of course he's changed. And that's exactly the situation with um, the second person of the Trinity or, you know, God, who they believe is God, right? He now has a permanent human nature fused onto the original divine nature. Ergo, God has changed. Ergo, it violates the principle of the Bible. God is eternal and changing. Yeah. And then you have, in, in addition to that, you have um, the, law, the law of non-contradiction, where we find in the Old Testament, God is actually, he's describing himself in a certain way, and, it, and the Jews are having a viewpoint of what God is doing. And then when Jesus comes, everything is turned on its head in the, from a theological perspective. Um, actually, and, and Christians, they, they'll come and say, well, in the Old Testament, God came down as the angel of the Lord. But actually, if you were to look in the theology of Judaism, they were having problems with even this concept. And that's why, you know, a lot of Christians, they like to quote Philo. But Philo, actually, when he came and he was speaking about the Logos, the reason why he was speaking and he was trying to use these Platonic, um, these, these terms of the Logos coming and the Word actually being God is because in Judaism, God was not supposed to be able to be seen by people. Nobody could see God and live. So yeah. they were having a problem with this from a theological perspective. And that's why Philo was thinking, well, then God could have created the Word and then actually then this was an external part of God or a representation of him, the Logos. And he was and the the the, the funny thing is is that all of this was stemming out of the Helen the Hellenistic viewpoint and in, in, in their philosophy, pagan philosophy. They were, the, all these concepts that they're using is from pagan uh, philosophy. But if you were to look at Judaism, Judaism itself was strictly monotheistic. And in addition to that, there, there is no indication, clear indication that James White in his in his discussion, he said, well, Muslims, they don't have a very close relationship with Jesus. You know, they don't have a close relationship with God like we do. You, and he, he mentioned about you loving uh, that we as Muslims, we love Jesus. And he said, well, I don't think that Muslims really do love Jesus because they don't know who he is. And my response to him in, in, in when Christians constantly use this is that just because you know somebody doesn't mean that they have to be a deity. You know, you can know your mother more than you know God, but you would respect God more. And the Jews, mind you, when, when James White and Christians, they constantly say, well, Jesus coming down in the flesh as a perfect human being and uniting with the flesh and becoming the priest or the rabbi, uh, the high priest to actually do the final sacrifice or whatever you, what have you. This, this story... And their closeness to Jesus um, and this, this very detailed descriptive character of Jesus, this goes completely against the relationship the Jews had before that with God. The Jews, yeah, that, the Jews that, were that, able that. to have, uh, the Jews were able to worship God. Abraham was, well, Abraham saw God come down as, as with the other two angels. Did, did they create pictures of of God, did did Abraham say, "Well, you have to recognize that the angel of the Lord and call him the angel, you know, to to worship him"? They didn't, and you know, so they were able to worship Yahweh without ever seeing him, without ever having to make uh, incarnate Im images of him, and they were perfectly fine with that relationship. 
So I don't know if you want to add on to this uh, this part. It's it, it's inconsistent in my point of view from a theological perspective. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, that, 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 that's the point that the video makes when it talks about um, the Jewish teacher of the law approaching Jesus and asking him, you know, what is the greatest commandment? And then, you know, he says, you know, like, God is one, you know, our Lord, here are Israel, the Lord our God is one. And the teacher says, you know, you are right. Um, and then Jesus says, you know, you are not far from the kingdom of God. So here, yeah, Jesus is affirming pure Jewish monotheism. And that was the perfect opportunity to say, actually, you know, yes, that is true. But what you don't realize is that God is one, but he's three persons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, but he doesn't say that, right? He affirms Jewish monotheism as the, the Jewish teacher understands it. And he compliments him saying, you know, you're not far from the kingdom of God. Now, and then the video makes the point that, you know, how is it that Jesus, God would send, you know, a representative preaching something that goes against everything that every other representative has ever taught on the subject of God's nature, right? You know, Abraham, Moses, David, Solomon, Noah, you know, all saying God is one and purely one. And all of a sudden now it changes. Yeah, God is one, but he's really, you know, but it's actually three persons. Yeah. And the, the way that they explain that is they talk about um, progressive revelation. And they say, okay, the, the, the New Testament basically shines more of a light on the things that the Old Testament talks about. So the Old Testament is kind of a part of the picture and the New Testament is the full picture. But really this, this causes more problems than it resolves because what that means is you can never really know whether you have the accurate understanding of God's nature because it's always subject to change. Exactly. I mean, how, how do Christians know that there isn't going to be an ultimate testament coming along some point where it says, ah, actually God is 10 persons or 20 persons. You know, they can, with this, with this um, theology of progressive revelation, you can never lay claim to knowing the nature of God or even having the correct understanding of the nature of God because it's always subject to change. Yeah. You know, how do we know that Mary Magdalene isn't a person of God? You know, that might, that might be revealed at some point. Whereas we as Muslims say, you know, yes, the, the rules and regulations might change from revelation to revelation, depending on time and place and circumstance. But the essential facts about God's nature, that will never change because God is consistent in what he reveals. Yeah. And I, I think that's, ki that's, that's kind of the point that we've been constantly trying to make is that the Jews were not expecting this to happen. And then all of a sudden, your heaven and hell, the, your theology, what makes you go to heaven or hell, completely changes and your viewpoint of God completely changes. When Jesus was calling himself, or, or, or at least according to the Christians, when Jesus is calling himself God, that, or, or when his followers were calling Jesus God afterwards, barely any Jews are following them. The majority of them, weren't following the Christian faith. They thought it was ridiculous what they were trying to say because it went completely against the previous scripture that they had. I mean, I, I would argue that it's actually devilish. I mean, you know, for, for God to allegedly spend thousands of years making you believe that he's, you know, purely one in every sense of the word and to all of a sudden to do a 180 degree turn and change everything on its head, that's actually quite devilish in the sense that, you know, could you blame someone for not believing that and rejecting it? Exactly, exactly. And the thing is, like what you just said now, if that was the case and that was that was possible, that God could come and then completely change this theology, who's to say that he's not going to do it again? Because there was no indication beforehand. There was a, there was a, a Messiah coming, but there was no indication that the theology was going to change dramatically. It was just that things, that, you know, the righteous people would be served now, you know, and whatever else is uh, uh, spoken in the Old Testament about the prophecies. But there was no real ideological change or an expectation of that. So for, for your theology then to be turned over on its head from that point of view, from that time, like you said, who's to say now then it's not going to happen again? And, the re and I'd, like to, I'd like to now jump on another point when we're talking about the Trinity and the persons. Can I, can I just add something very yeah, quickly? Go ahead, go ahead. What it actually shows is the inconsistency. Because when we say, for example, that the Prophet Muhammad, you know, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is, for top, is, you know, is a genuine prophet of God, they say, oh, but the Old Testament says that he can't be because he's not from the line of uh, Isaac. But hang on a second. Why has he got one standard for, for God's nature, as in things can be turned on their head, but then another for prophethood? So it's not, it's not very consistent, you see? Yeah, yeah. Um, so to, to, to continue on that, on that line of thinking, actually, to speak about the nature, the hypostatic union of God and him um, coming down and then actually being united with a person. Um, so the reason why it's okay for a person and not a monkey or an elephant or these things is because uh, 
they consider that we're created in God's image, right? So they, they think that that's okay because we're kind of like, you know, we're, ref, we're reflections of God, right? I guess. Um, so then God coming down as a man is okay, but not coming down as another person. But um, to, to, the, the issue with, you know, when, when Christians, they actually say that, well, Muslims, you, the Quran says that Mary was a part of the Trinity. Um, and we, you know, we, we clearly explain that this isn't the, the case, that, um, but there was an actual group that did worship Mary. Um, even uh, the Creed of Nicaea actually makes it kind of appear that Mary is um, a part of the Holy Spirit. But that's something, you know, that's something else. But the, the question would be asked, you know, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he does things sometimes just to get you to think. But w what we want, what we would ask is, even if, if, if Mary was to consider be a person, a part of this Godhead, a fourth person, uh, you know, where, where is the indication in the Bible that says there can't be a fourth person in the Trinity? Or well, it doesn't, it, it doesn't. There's no statement even saying there's, there's that there's only three. So yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's an open door from their point of view. You know, if you if you got progressive revelation and you know, and their standards, you know, and, and they and they believe the Trinity is scriptural when it never says anywhere, at least not in any authentic statement, that God is three. Then you know why can't he be four or five? You know, Revelations talks about you know the, the spirits around God's throne. You know, because there not be multiple Holy Spirits. You know, the doors open to all these kind of uh, in, uh, conclusions. Yeah. And this, I think this would actually be a good thing to shed light that, okay, the Quran doesn't, even in your, when James White was talking about your video, you're saying, well, Muslims constantly say that we believe that there's three gods, and we don't, and the Quran gets it wrong, saying don't say three, and that we believe that it's three gods. Now, there's different interpretations about this, but your interpretation, saying three persons in one being, that's your interpretation that that's not three gods. But to us, it's three gods. You're just doing hermeneutics to make it appear not to be three gods, right? Smoke and mirrors, uh, brother. Yeah. Smoke and mirrors. That's what it is. And, and the thing, I, I think the point that we could actually really lay down to them and start saying to Christians is to make them understand that actually you you believe in a pagan faith is what if there was a hundred persons? Would you, would you have a problem with that? Because if we're going to remain consistent on your theology, okay, then personhood should not have any effect at all in the one being. So I can come into your argument the way that your theology is, just to remain consistent on the theology, and I could create a Christianity that has a hundred persons. Mary, let's just say all the saints, all the Catholic saints, that they are all parts of it. Theologically, if you wanted to remain consistent, you should not think that this was a problem and this was paganism. The only problem that you would have is that your source of revelation, your main source being the Bible, which has its problems and has its various interpretations, mind you, because the hypostatic union, even the issue that we're talking about right now, it wasn't it, it wasn't settled until the fourth century. And a multitude of different uh, 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 heretical groups had stemmed from this. Arianism, one most popular one of, of them all. Why the C Council of Nicaea even took place in the first place. So, you know, uh, even this theology itself, your theology created so many problems. And I think it's hilarious to, think, to, to try to argue that this was the religion that Abraham brought to the Bedouin Jews living in Canaan. You know, try to imagine, you know, the, to explain the Trinity to simple Jewish, you know, uh, farmers or, 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 or herdsmen. You know, oh, well, the God is three and one and one and three. And they have nature. It would take you about an hour just to explain the Trinity, and then you're talking about the hypostatic union. Well, they're actually they're not they're together, but then they're not together. And the Bible, uh, it's the Word of God. Well, of course, the Bible wasn't there at the time of Abraham, but just try to imagine this: the Bible is the Word of God, but then it isn't, and there's man, you know, man, there's God's fingerprint on it, or it's God's breath, but then it's it's written by man, so then there's room for mistakes, and you know, it's kind of it's constantly they 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 keep themselves in this in this realm of remaining in two complete opposites and contradictory uh, 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 statements from a philosophical perspective, and and I don't know why they can't see it.
And it all, it's, it's clear that they're working backwards from their intended, fr from their theology. So they had a goal, you know, they had a theology and then they found out it didn't work and it didn't, it didn't, it, it didn't make sense. So then they had to work backwards from that to try to explain it, but they had to keep the, the conclusion. And, you know, so Jesus is, Jesus came down as a man, but he was God. Now let's work backwards from that and try to explain it. And that was all these councils, all these different heretical groups. They all stemmed out of this huge problems that they had in their theology. So, uh, so th th this is this is the interesting thing, right? Because James White says that if most Christians were to sit and examine the Trinity, they would fail as heretics, right? Because they don't really understand it. Yeah. And you know, we need to take a step back here and ask ask ourselves the question, you know, what is revelation? It's an opening up, right, an uncovering. So the fact that most Christians don't understand it, surely that's a sign that it's not actually genuine revelation because it just it, it, it's confusing. And the problem is that they 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 um they kind of piggyback that 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 with it's an essential belief, yet it's not understood by the masses. So how is it that we're forced to believe in something for our salvation, but it's difficult to understand and it's confusing for the average person? Those are odds, you know, that, that's not revelation, that's confusion. Yep. It's really, really a big problem. But, you know, do they, ask, do they ever ask themselves, maybe it's not true because it's so confusing. Why is it so confusing? You know, it's, it goes against the very purpose of revelation in the sense of an uncovering and making things clear to people, you know, about the unseen. Yeah. So it, it just, um, it's really, from that angle, it's also problematic, I think. Well, I think it, it, it sheds light on the the world that they were coming out of. They were coming out of Greek philosophy. And, you know, the, the philosophers there, in comparison to the Jews, because they looked down upon the Jews, because the Jewish faith was very simplistic, in, 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 in especially when you're talking about philosophy. Um, so they looked down upon them. But if you, I remember my sheikh, he was explaining to me how people of innovation, what they do and how they've gone astray. They overcomplicate things. And it's the equivalent of you when you want to scratch your ear. Instead of using your left hand and putting it up on your ear and scratching your ear, you use your right hand and you turn it over on your head and you scratch your ear. And you're doing all this complicated stuff to, to achieve a task that is very, it should be very simplistic. And when it comes, and, and I think this should move us on to when we're talking about theology and God's relationship with us, Allah or God is Al-Adl. He's the most just. And one of the things of justice is presenting to us a faith that is understandable and fair if you're going to hold us against if you're going to hold this against us right so one of the reasons why one of the philosophical reasons why we don't believe God would come down as a man okay is because this would contradict the religion of God telling us not to worship men it would not be fair God had told us don't worship graven image or people so then for, for then after that, if he was to set up a religion in which he said, hey, any time now I might come up as a man, but you don't know. But if you, you know, one of those guys, if you get it wrong, you're heaven and, you know, you're going to go to hell. That would be inconsistent and would not be fair. And it would go against the law of non-contradiction. Because if God can come down as a man, as a human being, how many people were claiming to be God before Jesus came? The emperor claimed to be God incarnate. The pharaoh claimed to be God incarnate. If we were to believe in a religion that God at any moment, you know, just because he can do some song and dance and mirror, you know, or do some magic, that means we have to believe in him. Then we would not be blamed if we worshipped Pharaoh. We would not be to blame if we worshipped the emperor. Because, and the reality is, and this is another point, the miracles that Jesus did, we did not witness. Only a small group of people. So all we have is your testimony. A testimony from a book that is very questionable of its authenticity. So if I was to tell you that I saw the Emperor, Empire State Building was disappeared and I was the only person that saw it or me and five people that you don't know, but I said that you're, you're going to either go to jail for the rest of your life if you don't believe me or you believe me and you have to change your life. I mean, it would be an illogical, unfair statement. We didn't see Jesus' miracles. Christians come and they say, oh, he did miracles and that proves his godness. We didn't see it. We weren't witnesses to it. We have every right to question it. You know, just because something was consistent throughout history and many people believed it, 
does not mean that that thing is authentic, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, and then they, you know, they make, they, they say that, you know, oh, it's, it's so clearly laid out in scripture. But this is the thing, you see, if you look at the, you know, the early church fathers, they didn't actually agree with each other on these fundamentals of, of, of God's nature. You know, for example, you know, Tertullian, you know, was one of the, the earliest, if not the earliest uh, church father to mention, um, you know, a, a Trinitas or a Trinity, God being three. He actually believed that the father was greater than the son. So he believed in things very different to what James White and other Trinitarians believe today. So that actually proves it isn't clear in scripture, because if it was, you'd have all the church fathers believing what's, what they believe today about the Trinity, but they don't. So that's actually proof that it isn't in scripture, at least not in a, on a clean you know, on in any clear fashion. Yeah, exactly. And you can interpret. And that's the thing, like James White, he knows a little bit of Greek, but and he, he constantly um, I was talking to the brothers on the WhatsApp group about this. Um, they, they always constantly um, cite that. Well, the Quran tells us to rule by our book, Ahlul Injil, to rule by what's in their hands. But the reality is, even if we were to take that case, their, their interpretation. Now, we have a different interpretation as well of that. But if we were to take their constant interpretation of this, that, okay, the people of the book, the Quran is telling you to rule by that book or to check into your book and to see that where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is. Is, is the Quran talking to every Christian? Is he talking to the layman that doesn't read Greek at that time? Was he talking to, is the Quran talking to the, you know, the person that's blind and can't see the things or understand or the, the insane person? It's talking to the people that actually are scholars of the religion that can look into the text, interpret it and see the differences in the Greek translations. Because as we see, even in the new, uh, the, uh, the new standardized version of the Bible, there's many different uh, translations for Greek words there. And they actually, there's footnotes there. There's like little A's, you know, uh, and uh, or bottom footnotes that say, well, actually, this word can mean something else as well. So the, the translation that people, you know, like James White and others, it's it's a theological translation that's reaching. It's it's making you reach one particular conclusion in your theology. But it could be that that sentence could be understood in a different way. That's why. And one prime example is the difference between the Old Testament interpretation of the Jews and the interpretation taken by the Christians, right? So it's it's two different, completely different types of approaches, theological approaches that extracts different types of conclusions, right? So for for Jews, they believe in more like a modalism type of God where God could come down to earth. And we have a problem with that. And we'll, we might need to talk about that as well. But I kind of laid that out that... Even if God was to come down on earth, number one, that it's, it's demeaning to his status to come down on earth. Number two, and we could get really deep into philosophy about God being surrounded by creation. And actually in, in Islam, we consider Allah al-Akbar. So he's the, not just being the greatest, but he is the largest. So he's outside of creation. He's never completely surrounded by creation. But the second thing is from a theological, consist, being consistent theologically and being fair. For God to come down as a man any time and we don't know who he is and we can't recognize him unless he does miracles, it, it would be unfair to put us in that predicament, right? It's the equivalent of saying God saying I can come down as a statue and then, you know, hey, but don't worship those other statues, but you'll know when that statue is me, you know? But the reality is, is that how many people didn't recognize Jesus was incarnate? Actually, when Jacob wrestled with God in the Old Testament, he didn't recognize him at first until sunrise. So even at that point where it, you know, Christians say that God came down and saw a prophet, a holy man, they didn't recognize him automatically. So all of a sudden now, God coming down as a man, your heaven and hell has been focused theologically on that point. It's unfair. It's inconsistent. It goes against the law of non-contradiction. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, at the end of the day, the Christian theology is the odd one out, right? I mean, you know, Islam and Judaism don't agree on all, all things, but they're very, very similar when it comes to the nature of God. Yeah. And, you know, just like you said, for things to change so much with the, with the coming of Jesus, according to them, it just, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. It's not consistent. And uh, like I said before, you know, it actually would be something more, more, more akin to something devilish than, than, you know, than, than what God would do to set you up basically for a fall. That's more or less what God has set up 
the Jewish people to do is for a fall, right? Because yeah. it was against everything the Old Testament said for thousands of years in the sense of, you know, the Messiah not being a divine being, you know, him being, a, you know, God not, not being a human being. And it goes against all of that. It, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And the explanation of progressive revelation creates more problems than it solves because then it opens the door to God being anything in the future. Yeah. I mean, in James White, in his video, just to, you know, to, to conclude, we had a, when, when we were talking, we were going back and forth. Uh, we it was going pretty well, and then Nabil Qureshi wrote something that he said, "Well, I left Islam and I found a loving God in in Christianity." And I wrote to him and I said, "Well, your loving God, according to your theology, had predestined me as a Muslim to go to hell." And James White then chimed in and said, "Well, this doesn't mean that and that." And I said, "James White, you're in, you're not being truthful in what you're saying because Calvinism they believe in you know that there was an elected." There's some people that were chosen to be guided. There's an yep. elect uh, group of people. So God predestined those people to go to heaven. These, that's part of Calvinism. You can't you know, work your way around that. So he predestined me then, according to your theology, to go to hell. That's not a loving God. I'm sorry. You're, you're, you, know, um, you have to remain consistent on that. All right. So um, to, on the final note, that let's, let's go over the issue of Jesus and his knowledge and how the Bible actually depicts what he knows. Uh, James White, in, in the video, he said, well, the, the, the passage of the fig tree, that this is metaphorical, okay, and that there's an interpretation for it, that this is supposed to mean, um, you know, Israel and them being cursed or what have you. Um, so what we find, though, and I, I'd like you to touch upon this, it, this isn't the only case. You talked about I mean, you only had so much time to give some examples. And so you were giving one example, and I think it's quite, a, quite disingenuous uh, from James White's uh, perspective to actually act like this was the only time that this was done. And I mean, from, from what I've read in the Bible, and even in the Old Testament as well, there, in comparison to Islam, the Islamic view of God, it's quite low. So God does things that are quite humanistic, even in the Old Testament. So you have in Genesis, God coming down to, uh, to, uh, to the garden and asking Adam, where are you, right? So in Islamic theology, we say that God says these things because he's usually when he asks a question, because he knows these questions are going to be written in Revelation in history. So to give um, a, a somewhat of a dialogue he will ask the question it's not that he doesn't know it it's a question to get the answer right but what we find with Jesus's depiction um, even even in the Old Testament as well when God came down and he said where are you and apparently Jesus according to Christ, uh, Christian theology or their their commentaries it was actually Jesus that went and went into Adam and made him uh, reply to God so that's quite odd. Uh, I, I just ran across that. Um, and but when you go and when you're looking at the New Testament, this person, this individual, Jesus, that's supposed to be God incarnate. Fine. I mean, if we were to actually imagine this picture of a person that's supposed to be God incarnate for a, for a person that never picked up the Bible, what would be if they were to give if they were to approach this issue? from a hermeneutical perspective, meaning that you're coming with a theology of who God is and you want to try to picture what God would be as an incarnate person. Um, it's clear as day that the G the character of Jesus would not, he doesn't characterize what a God man would be, even if that was the case philosophically or the uh, theoretically. And on a number of occasions, we find that Jesus is saying he, he doesn't know what's going on around him. It's not just the fig tree. So, for instance, when you have um, him, when he was healing people, and he was walking, and then a woman went up, and she, t uh, she touched his garment, and she was healed. And Jesus turned around and said, who touched my garment? He didn't know who it was, right? And then you had when Jesus calmed the storm. You know, the people had to wake Jesus up to let them know the storm, they're about to die. And Jesus told them, well, if you, you know, you don't have faith. And then he calmed the storm. But he didn't know. 
the, the picture that's being depicted here is that this is a man with maybe some divine attributes or some powers that were beyond man that was given to him. But even in Islam, we believe that the Dajjal, the Antichrist, can change the weather. You know, he can do miracles. He can bring people back to life. And um, the final note that I wanted you to cover on as well is that James White said that we don't know what the word Masih or the, the Messiah is. And in Islam, we do have it. So this was a false assumption on his part, a false accusation. We have it. We have it, it means just like Christians, the chosen anointed one, that yep. they were chosen to do something. And actually, we have the Masih al Dajjal has the same name denoted to him, but he's the exact opposite, right? So he's the Messiah, the Antichrist Messiah that we have. So we know what it means. It means a person that is chosen for a task at hand. It's a, and, and Jesus had an honorary status of it, and the Dajjal has this other status of it. So um, maybe you can touch upon this a little bit more and elaborate on it. Well, just get, using the, the, the fig tree um, incident as an example, this is a perfect illustration of, of uh, not, just not, not accepting what the text is telling you at face value and what, you know, the apparent meaning of the text. I mean, Mark is very clear in what he's saying. Jesus was hungry. He saw a fig tree and he went to approach it to find out if it had any fruit. You know, where does the text say that he approached it to, to, uh, to, to make a lesson out of it or to, you know, a, a, as a metaphor about, about Israel? You know, it gives the reason, gives the circumstances he was hungry and it gives you the reason why he approached the tree to find out if it had any fruit. You know, if he, if he already knew that it didn't have any fruit, he wouldn't have to approach it. If he already knew that it wasn't the season for figs, he wouldn't have to approach it in the first place. So it's a perfect example of a clear, clear and apparent meaning of a verse that's been turned into metaphor. And, you know, if you approach it with the mindset of Jesus is definitely God and he's all knowing, then, of course, you can have to go down the route of metaphor, because if you don't, then it just destroys your, 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 your whole belief system about Jesus. Yeah. Well, I mean, oh, and to touch upon about the Messiah as well, um, can you further elaborate about that? He, James White claimed that we don't know what the Messiah means. And um, can you explain what would be, you know, um, the Islamic viewpoint of what a Messiah would be? Uh, well, look, like you said, you know, the Messiah is the is the anointed one, right? Um, is the chosen one. And from that, you know, I, I, from my understanding is that, you know, the Jewish concept of the Messiah the one who would come to redeem his people is 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 the Islamic one. Yeah. How you get from that that is going to be a divine, the, you know, divinely crucified, you know, the a crucified God. I, I've got no idea, and it's another example of them turning things on the head completely. Yeah, yeah, I I think that's one of the things that they completely overlook is uh, from a historic perspective. Who was the person that the Jews were waiting for? What was the characteristics of him? They were waiting for this person, this great king that was going to take over the government because they were living under oppression under the Roman government. So that was their viewpoint. Their viewpoint was, wasn't was this Messiah figure. And actually, Jesus never even fulfilled that. <laughs> you know, he never, the Jews were waiting. And that's why the Romans, they were constantly killing anybody that claimed to be the Messiah. Now, James White, he constantly says, well, the Romans or the Jews wouldn't have had uh, Jesus killed unless he claimed blasphemy. And uh, Bart Ehrman and a number of individuals, they, uh, uh, biblical scholars, they said, no, actually, that's not the case. Because to the Romans, they wouldn't care less if Jesus claimed to be God or not. Right. It's not they don't really even care. They're pagans. They wouldn't care about it. It's and, the political connotations and yeah. implications that concern them. Yeah, so I mean, and and from the Jewish perspective, if we have to we have to keep in mind as well is that they the 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 Pharisees um, that they were they were inclined with the system. They wanted to keep with the system at the, there, and actually, it, it's to 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 actually create a situation or trying to overthrow the government, and they didn't know exactly for sure that this was the weighted awaited Messiah. Um, this is what I told James White when we were discussing on Twitter. One of the points I made was, is that, well, God set up the Jews for failure. And he said, what do you mean by that? I said, when the Jews crucified Jesus, why were they doing that? Why were they doing this? And I'll give you an example of what happened with the prophet. So I saw him when a woman tried to poison him. 
she put the poison in the leg of the, uh, of the lamb when he gave it to, to him. And he asked her later on, why'd you do this? And she said, well, if you were really a prophet, then God would have protected you anyways. And that was kind of the situation with the Pharisees and the Jew, you know, the, the Jews at that time, is that they were putting Jesus on a tree, you know, putting him and wanted him to be crucified to try to see if this was the case, to try to prove that he wasn't this awaited individual, this, uh, the, the, this awaited king that they had. So God had set them up, you know, and like what you said, this is kind of devilish when you really step back and think about it. God had set them up for failure, theological failure, because in their religion, they believed anything that was hung from a tree is cursed. And that's why they crucified Jesus in the first place, to try to yeah, prove the fact. It's the, 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 the Islamic concept of Jesus, you know, coming back at the end times, you know, establishing a law, ruling the world, you know, that actually fulfills the, the Jewish uh, concept of the Messiah. Yeah. Um, because, you know, then they'll be able to follow him. And, you know, it's not too late to be, you know, to, to, to enter, you know, uh, belief in Jesus and so on and so forth. But with the Christian concept of his second coming, it's game over. It's going to come with fire and brimstone. It's too late then, you know. Yeah. So when he does finally establish his kingdom on earth, it's going to be, he's going to come to destroy the enemies of God. So, you know, it's going to be too late then. So it's the Islamic concept of him coming back and ruling the world and, you know, the Jewish people being able to follow him um, and believe in him, you know, that fulfills the, the, the Old Testament concept of the Messiah, not, not the Jewish, not, not the Christian concept, which goes completely against it. Yeah. And actually, even the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I, I mean, when, when you really step back and look at what he was doing, the Prophet, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he first came and, came and claimed to be a prophet, you know, when we're debating with Christians, they say, well, how do you know what's a prophet? What are the characteristics of the prophets? Well, I mean, look what this man did. He was brought in the middle of a pagan area. You know, the whole Arabian Peninsula was pagan, except for small pockets of Jews and Christians. And he completely turned that around and brought them to worshiping from a theological perspective, step back and without names. One God, one creator. If you were to simplify the religion like a Jewish herdsman. One God, one creator. He brought those people from worshipping idols and multiple things to this one creator. And the religion of Islam from, uh, from the Sharia perspective, from the law perspective, is almost identical to the Jewish before, the Jewish law before. It's almost identical. So all these reservations, well, God did this, even the wars that the Prophet, peace be upon him, fought. According to the Old Testament, the wars that Joshua and Moses, uh, Moses, Joshua, Saul, and David fought were far worse than what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, fought. Because the Prophet was fighting small tribal wars, tribes that were, you know, around 500 to 1,000 people. So, you know, so it wasn't, and there wasn't many casualties. Not more than 10% of people would die before the people or, or were killed or injured before the people would retreat. So this wasn't massive genocide. And actually, I've done figures and I found that actually the, in the 10 year span period of the Prophet's life, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you were to take even the weak hadith of the Saraya, the, the casualties on the enemy side doesn't exceed 4,000 people, deaths. That's 10 years of fighting wars. 10 years. So this one single battle, or, or excuse me, 10 years of wars, with the Prophet Sallallahu was the equivalent of, was almost the equivalent of one situation in the Bible of the Old Testament. Moses had put to death 3,500 people for apostasy with the Levites. And, and according to um, uh, uh, biblical historians, the battle of Jericho with Joshua, that the, the inhabitants of the people of that city, when they looked at the remains, they said that it's about it's 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 about the same number about 3000 to 4000 people living in that city that could live in that city and and Joshua went and that was just one fight one battle and he went all through Canaan you know fighting different cities and it, and he killed everybody in that and in Islam we're not allowed to kill women and children but for Joshua he was allowed to he was ordered to kill everybody there so i don't see i don't see the consistency here the demonization. What makes a prophet? The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
He fulfilled what the Jews were waiting for. The Jews were waiting for somebody to overthrow the government and take over the land that they were un that was under their feet. That happened within a hundred years after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yeah, I mean, but for, for, see, from a from a from a Christian progressive revelation point of view, even if Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't fulfill uh, these things, then what, on what basis can they say that he's not a prophet? Because if you can, if they if they accept God going from being purely one in every sense of the word to being three then why can't he be a prophet and what basis can they reject him you know even if the quran does change things up a little bit in terms of its theology you know for the, for the quran to reveal that jesus wasn't crucified for example progressive revelation what, what's their problem they're not consistent you see yep yep alhamdulillah alhamdulillah i mean we could keep going on brother with this all day and i hope this bring this opens the dialogue uh with james and uh, with any other apologists that want to, uh, you know, uh, address these issues with us, we're more than happy to, to to open, you know, a line of communication between us. Maybe we can set up some uh, discussions here on our uh, Zoom room with uh, MAP Muslim Apologetics. Uh, I'd like to thank our brother Abu Zakaria uh, once again from Many Prophets One Message dot com for coming on. Jazakallah khair, brother. Uh, uh, so, so with that, we'll close. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.